on behalf of the Danish Union of Journalists and Copenhagen Docs, welcome to this post-screening question and answer session with uh, Bastian and Frederik Obermeier. Um, my name is Henrik Molke. Uh, I am an investigative journalist and currently um, science and technology correspondent at Danish Broadcasting. And um, I have chosen to be here even though I am on paternity leave because I am a great fan and admirer of these two gentlemen. Um, and because we have had the honor of working together in the past and I honestly just wanted to see them again. Um, being such big um, hotshot journalists nowadays, it's a, it's a rare occurrence. So I'm, I'm really happy to see you guys and uh, congrats on the film and congrats on, wow, so many things that, that have happened since I last uh, got to see you. Um, I don't think you guys need much of an introduction, Bastian and Frederick, um, but I was thinking we could maybe start with a little sort of, because now people have seen this film, can you tell us a little bit about how you guys actually met and, and got to work together? How did this uh, partnership start? Um, well, as the older one, I, <laughs> I may begin. Uh, so I, I got hired by the former head of our investigations department at Süddeutsche Zeitung um, right after my paternal leave, by the way. And um, after like three or four months, my 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 boss told me that he's going to hire the other Obermeier too. And I thought he was just, you know, kidding and making fun because it was so silly that there were the same paper, two guys with the same last name, but he was being very serious. And um, so he uh, he hired the other Obermeier and we paired up for our first stories. And as being the young guys, that, that's his wording, um, not mine, and the ones who were able to work with computers, <laughs> he, he kind of made us work together on offshore leaks um, mm -hmm. in 2012. And uh, we, just, uh, we just kept it that way. And now we are working as a, as a team for nine years or so. And it's great fun. Frederick, uh, the first time I met you, um, I was actually not able to meet you, I think, best in the first couple of times because we were working on the Snowden leaks and uh, we were super busy. I think you also just became a dad, Frederick, and Bastian disappeared. He was just, he was busy yes. with something else. During my parental leave. So. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> There's a pattern here. <laughs> But, but because the film starts with Snowden, can we maybe start there and talk a little bit about how the Snowden experience and, and uh, Panama Papers tie together and, and what, um, what happened then? Well, I mean, when the two of us, when we met the first time, um, the whole world spoke about a brave whistleblower from the NSA telling the world what the US authorities did with the help of their allies. And for me, I was a big admirer of those journalists who worked with this uh, whistleblower. And then some years after, um, Bastian, we were in a similar position when a whistleblower called, calling himself John Doe approached us and handed us what is was later known as the Panama Papers. And um, when I worked on uh, the Snowden stuff, I would never have imagined um, myself being in such a position um, and in such a position that bears such a responsibility. Um, so when Bastian and I started working uh, with John Doe, we basically learned a lot um, from Snowden. We thought a lot, what can we learn from uh, Edward Snowden's fate, um, him being trapped in Russia? Which precautions could we take over um, that he and Glenn Greenwald or Laura Poitras um, put in place? Um, and of course, we um, consulted a lot of security experts who worked also with Edward Snowden um, and learned from them. And then meeting several years later after the Panama Papers, uh, this whistleblower in Russia was basically closing a circle. Um, it was us um, sitting there together speaking about um, the NSA revelations, but also about the Panama Papers and what it means to be a whistleblower in these days in a time when whistleblowers are unfortunately still under a lot of pressure 
that was a huge honor um and i still remember very often um those uh, hours uh in moscow sitting down there and having i mean it was supposed to be a an interview but in the end it was a very nice conversation um and after that uh, conversation, I even more admired um, what Edward Snowden has done, what John Doe has done, and what uh, dozens of other whistleblowers whose name we don't even know um, have done in the past years, helping journalists to um, shine light on stuff that the politicians or businessmen and the corrupt and the crooks want to hide from the public. You, you have been involved, I think, more than almost any journalist in the world in, in, in these mega leaks and these gigantic file um, bonanzas and, and have managed to steer through them in a really admirable way. Um, can you talk a little bit about the relationship between you and these sources? I know with Snowden, you had some sort of relationship with the others, you had uh, even less. Um, can you talk a little bit in general about the, the role of of your your role as a journalist kind of trying to maneuver these these big big uh files and these uh these documents and then the relationship with the supposed source this is something that obviously interests me a lot because i've been in the same situation with snowden and and it's something that i'm going to return to during this conversation how you maneuver this relationship but but just maybe start with snowden and how the the, the sort of relationship between you and your sources have have influenced your uh, reporting on these different uh stories that we see during the film do you want to start uh, bastian yeah well so um we actually sp sp spoke a lot about snowden with our different sources because he's you know the 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 symbol of the whistleblower and and we heard very often the sentence i don't want to end up in moscow and you know so so our aim was to help to help our sources not not to have to flee to a country like russia for safety and which is a real strange situation you know and and so um you know our job as as journalists was always said at least that's what we think was to to guard the the whistleblower and to explain what his or her deeds may or may not mean for for his or her security and so the the first step that, that we had to make uh, was to make sure that we are not making a big mistake that was what Frederick meant um said in the in his last sentences and at the same time we wanted to be helpful to our sources for them not to make a big mistake and we had many discussions with a number of sources about the questions should i should i go public should i show my my name should i should i give my motivation should i show my face even should i should i do interviews and and all of those questions have to be thought about and and there may be different answers from case to case but the the most important thing um is i think that you have to be aware as a whistleblower that you can't redo this step the step of going public you 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 can't you can't take it back then you know you, your your face is then out there your name is out there and it, there's no way that you can really you know, steer the media. So I think um, we we are not the ones. We are not the ones making the decision if a whistleblower would go public or not. But uh, but of course we have to give advice, especially to to people who have no experience with any media at all. There's a there's a scene in the film where you, Bastian, are in Malta. It's very hot, and you're going back to to Daphne Galicia's house. Um, I'm very impressed that you managed to stay so classy in your clothes uh, in spite of the, the, the very hot climate there. Um, but talk a little bit about, because this seems to be a point where this gets personal for you, where the the fate of, of Daphne Galicia uh, um, weighs on you personally. Um, and, and of course, in these big projects with so many other people, um, it is inevitable, I can imagine, that... that um, 
it gets under your skin um, and that the relationship with the source becomes complicated. Um, can you talk a little bit about that scene where you're in Galicia and you see the place where she was killed and and you sort of, um, I, I can imagine it's very different when you're actually there. Um, talk about what, what, what that was like and what, what reflections it, it's uh, brought you about uh, your relationship with the with the sources, but also, of course, the, the people you worked with in these projects? Well, when, when I was standing there in the, in the meadow where she was um, was killed, uh, or where she was found dead, um, I mostly thought about her son, Matthew Caruana Galitza, with whom we, um, Farik and me, have, have worked numerous times and, and who is a very dear friend, and and um, we had contact on, on the day that his, his mother was, was killed, and he asked us to to tell the story to the people and and the public when we asked what we can do to help. And I think that this is kind of you know the most we can do. Um, and when 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 we are doing big stories, then the one thing is, you know, to the reporting and the fact checking and and this stuff. And the other thing is what what happens after. And when we did the Panama Papers, for example, we always had the big fear that someone gets killed because we shared the documents. You know, it, some one of our friends in the world, some one of the 400 reporters may have gotten killed or the source may have gotten killed. And we thought and spoke about how that would would weigh on us. And and uh, but there was no. So we we just we just couldn't imagine it. So we, we stopped the discussion because you you can't imagine something like that. And then Daphne got killed and then Jan Kuciak got killed and they they both weren't killed very likely because of the Panama Papers revelations from Jan's case. We know that from Daphne it very likely had to do with her revelations that were near to the Panama Papers case. Mm. But you know the big the big question that our source had asked us back then, would it be my fault if someone gets killed? And and you can't answer that because I mean, it's not, but still, you know, John Doe started it and we shared the documents. So the stories got out and I think it did a lot of good, but it may also have, you know, some very bad sides and you've got to live with that. Frederick, when, when we worked together, it was a small setup with, I think, maybe 10 journalists involved, but at three different media. And we already had some friction happening because of that. Um, and I remember us discussing that back then, and yet you've managed to work with hundreds uh, of journalists and, and without any, at least to my knowledge, big, big mishaps. Can you talk a little bit about this management, I guess it is, of, of, of actually keeping things secret with so many people involved and also technically and practically executing without flaws? Um, because I think one of the things that I admire most about, about you guys is how structured and orderly and 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 rigorous you have been and why that is so important in investigative journalism. Can you talk a little bit about that, um, Frederick? I must admit I had some audio problems. I could only hear your last word. Okay. Um, how did you manage to keep so many people working together and keep it secret and safe and also uh, manage all these people? Um, because that is an incredible feat having just worked with you and 10 journalists that was already hard well i think that was that's still a miracle to be honest that it worked more or less um we already from the beginning had a plan b we had emergency plans what happens if some something leaks out because we all know journalists talk a lot um especially when they drink a beer or or a wine or two beers or two glasses of wine so um, for us, it was the biggest challenge from the beginning on to explain to our colleagues and what is at stake, uh, that we have a source here, that we have a responsibility for the source, but also for our colleagues. We had 
meetings here in Munich that were on that pretend text that we basically told our other colleagues here at Süddeutsche who didn't know about the Panama Papers revelations that this is only an international meeting of journalists. Um, but at that meeting, we had um, colleagues from Russia, from Africa, from Latin America stepping up and telling all of us what's at stake for them, that they their lives would, could be a danger if something leaks out before the agreed publication date. And I think that is what kept this group together, that everybody understood there is so much at stake that and nobody wanted to be the one journalist um, who was whose fault it is that this story um, gets blown out to the public before the agreed date and thereby puts a source in danger um, or colleagues. And therefore, I think one of uh, our lessons that I must admit I learned from journalists like you um, is, and I only repeat it, um, is um, one of the rules was shut up and encrypt, encrypt all <laughs> your stuff, encrypt your messages, encrypt your hard drive. And I still remember you um, sitting down with me and telling me how encryption works, um, how the, the best tricks works. Uh, and I learned a lot from you and from all the uh, journalists who worked with Edward Snowden. So we basically repeated again what we learned from the Snowden case because we were well aware of the fact that everything that we had um, on our laptops needs to be encrypted, that every communication needs to be encrypted. Um, and that is, I think many of us had to learn a lot. Um, it was basically building a plane while sitting on a plane. There were colleagues from different parts of the world for they don't have the best equipment. So ICAJ did an amazing job teaching them, teaching us, consulting with us. And I think that was what made the Panama Papers such a success in the end. Um, I should mention, we, we have a bunch of audio uh, journalists watching and you're of course super welcome to send questions uh, in the YouTube chat and I will see them here in front of me and, and ask them in a minute. Um, something that was new to me watching this film was the role of your editor-in-chief, Krach, um, which I found really fascinating. And um, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about something that's fascinating for me, for example, is you go up to this office and you use the German term Z um, to, for, for your boss, which for me is a is, 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 um, very different culture than, than I've worked in. And yet he seems to be able to, to, to sort of put you guys in a place where you are able to carry out some of these. It's most visible in the film in the Strache uh, Ibiza affair. Um, and, and I noticed at one point, right after publication, he tells you very pointedly not to become too triumphant after a publication. And, and I want to talk a little about his role and how, how you guys managed to keep doing these things, how you managed to not become, um, you know, total assholes uh, after all the success you've had and, and still managed to stay um, very stringent and, and uh, never proud or, or arrogant about your, um, your work. Uh, because that must be hard. Well, I don't know if it's that hard not to become an asshole. I think it's, uh, <laughs> it's manageable. Um, so, um, so, so our relationship with Mr. Grach is, is kind of special because um, he used to be an investigative reporter himself um, at Der Spiegel, which is a very small and not a really important magazine in Germany. <laughs> but um, Still, he was working there, and so, so he knows exactly w what we're doing, and that's unbelievable worth for to have a boss who does not come with you know with requests that are from another world and with silly ideas, but you know someone who really knows what what we are talking about and what we have to endure and what we have to do, and and it's a little embarrassing, but w whenever he reads our pieces. He has really, really good ideas what to change. And that's when we are most embarrassed, when we have to admit that he's right and he's right again. And I mean, as, as every boss, we, we, have our, we have our difficulties with him, but um, he's having our backs. Um, and, and that was very, very necessary when we did Panama Papers. Already then, he was the one that we spoke a lot with, and he was responsible for this part of the paper, and he still is. And and 
And yes, he he's he's also watching us very closely. And whenever he has the the impression that um, we are flying too high, then he's giving uh, us a warning, you know, to come back to planet Earth. But um, we think is, is that, that something that happens uh, often because you you have. You, you are at a point now where you already achieved more than most journalists would dream of in their entire life. Is there a point where he says, okay, enough with this uh, Daphne uh, project or enough with this Iranian uh, arms dealer or, or what happens? We don't see a lot of that mm. in the film, but I'm wondering. N not really in this way. So he's not interfering in in our project. He's not telling us what to do and, and what, to, what not to investigate. And he would never... He would never say stop okay. the Daphne project or the, the other thing. It's it's more like, you know, when he gets the feeling that we are we are giving too many interviews or right. stuff like that. Right. So yeah. But it, it didn't happen really often, honestly, maybe one or two times. I have a question uh, from a viewer which uh, which ties together with another question I had. Namely, you you are such big names now. Is that is that making source contact harder now? Um, and I wanted to ask because there's a scene in the film where you're at the Munich security conference and you take one of the participants out for a walk and, and Frederick, you're talking about how being at the conference, people watch each other and they might guess each other's uh, stories. So, uh, has this changed for you? Is it harder now? Well, it depends. With some sources, um, the first contact um, is easier because mm. it's you have a better entry if you tell somebody that you are from Süddeutsche Zeitung because that doesn't ring a bell to be honest with most sources especially when they're not from Germany but if you mention that you have done or have been part of the Panama Papers that helps a lot um, and that opens doors mm. on the other hand side it's sometimes more difficult to speak with people where you don't want to raise that much suspicion so approaching somebody low profile doesn't work that well anymore after the Panama Papers. Um, but of course, at a conference like the Munich Security Conference, every journalist watch, watches his or her colleagues. Um, it's always like, you see who is talking with whom, and you, you could already guessing, I could already guess who is working on which uh, story uh, from the people he or she is speaking with. So that's a really, a, from my experience, I don't like to work in this environment, to be honest. I rather work, um, in places where I can meet a source in a park, um, go uh, out for a walk or stuff like that and don't have to be that cautious with whom I speak um, and who is maybe watching. There's a there's a number of different stories that are presented throughout this film, um, but the crux of the film is about the Strache, the Ibiza affair. Um, I'm interested in your source relationship with that particular project because it seems the most murky and the most uh, dubious um, can you talk a little bit about how that happened and what has happened after? Because it's you, you keep dropping leads throughout the film until at a certain point you talk about now you're going to Ibiza and then you talk about they, the people that work with you on the on the files and you have to wear these glasses and it's all very professional. Can you talk a little about how that, that whole thing happened and also how you managed to be working on a documentary film while having to juggle these different sensibilities around your sources and the crew, I imagine, that had, has followed you around. Um, well, Bastian, do you want to try? Yeah, yeah, I can start. It's, it's always hard to know who should answer. <laughs> should not... I'll, I'll, I'll say your name from now on. Great. So, um, um, yes, I mean, it was um, one of the most most complicated cases because um, we d we did not really understand um, what was going on and we asked many questions and we could fact check what we get got for answers and we had many conversations and we always try to stay put and to hold contact and but but in the end we could only guess, you know, if we would get a hold of the material at any given day. So, so it was really um, an investigation where many times when when the two of us spoke about it, we said, like, 
you know, probably we'll never get the video and we'll never make the story. And then, um, you know, after the next meeting, we thought, oh, maybe, maybe we'll get it. And um, the hard thing was that um, we didn't really know what, how we could help, you know. Um, so we just could explain the way we are working. We explained that we need the video in our hands. We need to have a forensic um, expert to look at the file and to tell us that it's not being manipulated. And we needed uh, we needed time, and we needed the trust. And we would give nothing back. So we made it very clear that we are never paying for information and and material whatsoever. Um, not a single euro, not a cent. And, but, but yeah, so it was really... Um, but what was the deal with the documentary director, Saga? Like, was he, was he did, did you have to edit things out afterwards? Or was it easy all, the, all along? Or, or was that complicated? Because you must have had conversations, or are you always this aware of your surroundings that you don't make any mistakes when there's a... I would be glad if that would be the case, <laughs> um, but no, um, of course there was um, Sagar, Daniel, um, there was at a certain point in time, I mean, he followed us for so many months. So yeah. there was a base of trust. We trusted him, he trusted us, but of course there was this mutual understanding that if source pro uh, protection is at stake, that there would be a way of communicate that this or that part could not be um, in the video. Mm -hmm. And it's important to point out at this point, he never met the source. Um, so he never um, saw any, any, any individual um, that was con uh, connected to us handing uh, over a video showing us the video because that was something that we would not have wanted um, and I'm sure um, the source uh, neither. So this was something that was not possible. Um, I have another question, which kind of ties to an overarching theme in this in this um, film about you, which is the the sort of the era that this depicts was a time when when there's never been more attacks on the press and the trustworthiness of journalism has been more under siege. And I want to talk a little bit about how you manage that and how sort of what advice you have to young reporters or reporters uh, watching this uh, about how to maintain um, a sober and, 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 and fact-based trustworthy journalism and where you see maybe your contributions uh, um, going in the, in the future so that, that I imagine it stays this way. Well, I think um, one thing that we've, ha we've learned over the years that we have to be more more transparent about the way we are working as we used to be. So um, when I started at the paper, there was one of the most important sentences um, was that we don't write about ourselves. And um, we like the wind, but we don't make the wind was one of the hmm. saying of our former bosses. And I think um, that we, we have to explain um, a lot more and and part of this is um, because we, the people don't know how how journalism is done in many aspects. So um, for example, when we tell people that we are never paying for information, that's news to, to many of them, you know. And in this case, we knew that Mr. Strache would fight fight us, you know, until the last uh, uh, um, um, drop of blood in his vein, veins. Um, so what we did, we we tried to to fact check, you know, like everything we could to not give him an entry. So uh, we did not only do the, the forensic guy with the video, but we also had a Russian translator who is certifying Russian language at courts, and we also had a lawyer who was watching the video and was um, certifying that what we have, you know, as quotes in our our pieces, is being said. Except the try to to make 
as much as we could, you know, really, really hard and and for no one to just toss away. I'm being told that we're out of time, but we do have time for one short uh, question and answer. What's next? What are you guys working on now? And what would you really like to do? Um, you're, you're incredibly young, both of you, but I imagine that there are still things you'd like to uh, to break open and, and report on. Well, Henrik, you're an amazing journalist and you ask amazing questions, but I'm really sorry that that's the question we cannot uh, reveal yet. Um, but um, I, I mean, I can speak, I think for both of us, we uh, are looking forward to uh, investigations with other colleagues because with a collaborative effort, because that's the way how we like to work as a team, um, as a team in Germany, but also as a team with uh, journalists from other parts of the world. And also, um, we would be more than happy to work with journalists uh, from Denmark again. Thank you both very, very much. And congrats on the film and everything. Thanks. Henry. Thank you. It was great fun. Thank you. Thank you.